Hi everybody, I am Sandeep Gupta and we are here to study a subject called OOPM, the full form being Object Oriented Programming Methodology. In case you are wondering what is OOPM, so it is nothing but the Java programming language. Okay, so before we start with Java, let's understand what all problems we are going to face in Java. So as I always tell you all that you will find Java difficult because it is a programming subject. So if you're not very good in C programming, Java will automatically become a little difficult for you guys. But that's not all. There is one more problem with Java and that problem is that its syntax is very long and very difficult. Now to understand this, let's take an example. Let's say there is a variable n and let's say you want to read the value of variable n in C language, not Java, in C language. So if you want to read its value in C language, will you write printf? No. To read its value in C language, you will write something like scanf. Okay, scanf is a standard statement for reading values in C language. Now, if you want to do the same thing using Java, then what will you do? So, first you will write this statement, then this statement, and that's not all. Finally, you will write this statement. So, you can see very clearly a small statement of C language became three such huge statements in Java. Okay. But that's not all. If you look at these three statements a little carefully, you will also realize something interesting. You will realize some alphabets in, are in uppercase and some are in lowercase. Uppercase means capital and lowercase means small. So look, this I, S, R, look at this B, R, they are in capital in uppercase. Look at this I, look at this I, they are in uppercase. Not only that, if you see carefully, you will realize this P is in lowercase. This R is in lowercase, but this L is in uppercase. So another problem with Java is that you should also maintain this uppercase and lowercase properly otherwise the program will report an error. See that's not the case in C language. In C language everything is uniformly in lowercase but in Java this uppercase and lowercase should also be maintained properly. So as a result of all these things the programs in Java become very long and very difficult. Okay. Now let's talk a little about the marking scheme of Java. So for most of the streams, Java is for 100 marks, where 50 mark is for your term work and 50 mark is for your oral and practical. Now let's talk about this term work a little. Now in this term work, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to create a mini project. Now most of the students struggle a lot creating this mini project, but you need not worry about this. I'm sure you must be knowing that in our Java course, we are going to do a total of five projects. Of these five projects, the last two projects are so good that you can submit them as your college mini project also. So your 50 marks are taken care of over here. Now the remaining 50 marks are for your oral and practical exam. So as usual, you'll be given one program in your practical exam, which you are supposed to perform. After the program is over, you will be asked questions mostly on the entire syllabus and based on your orals and practicals, you'll be given another 50 marks. Okay. So that will compute a hundred marks. Another thing which you should know is that in the academic year starting June 2020, you may have a theory exam also in Java because your syllabus could change in the coming year. So if you are having theory exam, then obviously all these marking scheme will change. The marking scheme will likely uh, will increase to 150 or maybe even 200. But what I want to tell you over here is that you should not study Java because you have a theory exam in it or because you have an oral practical exam in it. No, that should not be the reason of studying Java. So then the next question is then why should we study Java? So let's understand the importance of Java. Okay. Now Java is very important because it is the first object oriented language. Now what is an object oriented language? An object oriented language is the one in which we use the concept of classes and objects. See, remember one thing, if you have done C language earlier, then in C language, you have never studied classes and objects. And that's why Java is completely different from C language. Things which you study in Java are completely different from what you have studied in C language. And that is why Java becomes the foundation of object oriented programming. So if you don't study Java properly, you will never understand how to use these classes and objects properly. Okay. Now, if you don't study Java properly, what else will happen is, you know, what happens is in your subsequent semesters, you will have these languages to study. So in your next time, you may have Python. Then after that, you will have JavaScript. Then after that, you will have Android programming. 
Python in SEM4, JavaScript in SEM5, Android programming in SEM7. Now once again, in all these languages, in all these technologies, you need to use the concept of classes and objects. So if you have not done Java properly, you will not know how to use classes and objects properly and you will struggle here and you will struggle here also. Okay, so that's why you should take Java very seriously. Now another reason why Java is so important because Java is a dominant language on the backend, on the server side. Now let me elaborate a little about this server and all. Uh, pay good attention over here because this concept will be used after half an hour also. See what happens is that whenever you are on the internet, the internet works on the client server model. I repeat client server model. So the computer which you are using is called the client and your computer interacts with a server. The server is that computer which will host the website, I mean which will store the website. So when you are on the internet and when you click on something, what you are basically doing is, what your client computer is basically doing is, it is sending a request to the server and then the server responds to that request, okay? So this is how the client server model works. Now why I mentioned about it is because on the client computer, programming is normally done, internet programming is normally done using JavaScript, HTML and CSS, which you will be studying in the subsequent semesters, okay? So when you are working on the internet, your program on the client computer is normally coded using JavaScript, HTML and CSS. Now, as I told you that when you click on something, you are sending a request to the server and the server will obviously do processing and that of that request and will respond to your request. So on the server side also, there should be a program which will respond to your request and the program on the server side is normally coded in Java and off late it is coded in Python also. So Java and Python, they are server side programming languages. That means they are used at the on the back end on the server. Now what happens is Java is, a, is the most preferred language when it comes to software which are used in banking, airline reservation, hotel reservation and so on. So whenever we do internet banking, okay, it is Java which plays a role over there. Similarly, whenever we book our tickets on the internet or whenever we book a hotel on the internet, okay, you are basically interacting with a Java program which is running on the server. Java is widely used in big, big softwares, okay. Finally, another importance of Java is in placements. See, what will happen is that when you are in SEM7, companies may come to your colleges for placements. Now, companies like uh, Accenture, Infosys, TCS, when they come for placements, they may have a technical round in which they will ask you questions on C and Java. And that's why you should know C and Java very nicely, properly. If you don't know these two languages properly, then don't expect to get placed in these companies. So because of these reasons, Java is very important and you should take Java very seriously. Now uh, I will show you some newspaper cuttings to convince you how important this data structure, how important programming is. Uh, see what happens is now uh, before semester three, you, stood, you guys don't give too much of importance to programming. And if you don't give too much of importance to programming, then you will have a tough time later on. So to explain you these things, I have some newspaper cuttings over here. So this, uh, this article says that 25 Indian pupils told to leave US university after first semester. So this is a case of I think two years back, there were 25 students who were studying uh, MS, that means post-graduation in a US university. Obviously they had spent lakhs and lakhs of rupees in doing that. So they spent six months over there and after that the college told them that you can leave this, you can leave the college, you can leave the university and you should go back to India. So just imagine uh, after spending so much of time and so much of money, the college tells you to go back to your country. Now do you know why they were told to go back? The reason is very simple. The reason was that they did not know programming. They could not write even simple, simple programs. So the university felt it's better that these students should be suspended. Now take one more article over here. This is one article which I show my students many a times. It says that poor engineering makes 47% grads unemployable. Now read this unemployable very carefully. What it says is, it says poor engineering makes 47% graduate students unemployable. So it means that there are jobs, there are jobs but students are not fit to be employed. 
Now the question is why they are not fit to be employed. So very quickly just read this. What it says is 50 to 60 percent of computer science or information technology engineers don't understand subtleties of programming concepts. So as you see clearly over here it says that more than half of comp IT students don't know programming. All right. Similarly, over here it says only 14.97% of the engineers are able to do application of programming constructs. So over here it clearly says that only 15% of the comp IT engineers are capable of doing programming. So guys, year onwards take programming very seriously. If you don't take programming seriously, you will have a tough time later on. Before we start with the course, let me give you a few instructions. Whatever I am telling you now is applicable to both the subjects data structures as well as Java. Okay. Now for both the subjects, I will be providing you with printed notes. What I will do is I will give you a PDF of the printed notes and you can use this printed notes to refer to the theory question answers. What I have done is, as you can see over here, I have given the entire theory in question answer format and not only that, I have given each answer point wise. Now because of this question answer form, because of this question answer format and point wise answers, it will be very easy for you to remember the theory answers. These theory answers will help you a lot in your theory exam and also for understanding of the concepts. Also, let me tell you one more thing guys over here that as of now you don't have a theory exam in Java but under the new syllabus that means from June 2020 onwards you may have a theory exam in Java also. Okay, So if that is the case these printed notes will help you a lot otherwise also they will help you in understanding the concepts. Now. <clears throat> Normally what I do is I provide a hard copy of the printed notes. Whenever the classes start that means in the month of August or whenever it is July August you should come to the coaching classes and you should take a hard copy of the printed notes. But there is one thing which I want to tell you over here listen to this very carefully. Many a times what I will do is I will tell you to write something or draw something in your printed notes. Okay. So that time what you should do is uh, let me give you an example over here let's say let's take example of data structure okay and let me go to page number seven okay so see this is page number seven and during the course i will tell you to write something over here now you obviously don't have a hard copy of the printed notes so what you should do is in your notebook you should write page number 7, point number 10 and you should write the things in your notebook. Later on when you get the hard copy of the printed notes, you will transfer those diagrams from your notebook to the printed notes. If you have a printer at home, you can take a printout from this PDF. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So that was about uh, drawing diagrams and writing in your printed notes in your notebook rather. Another important thing which I want to tell you about printed notes is that sometimes during the video I may tell something like refer PN20, refer PN30. So when I say refer PN20, PN is the printed notes and 20 is obviously the page number. Now what is important over here is that sometimes in the video I may dictate a particular question and I may tell you to refer let's say PN25. Okay. So let's say the question is program for keeping two stacks within a single linear array. Okay, so this is the question. So I may dictate the question and I may say refer PN25. Now if you look over here, this question is not on PN25, it is on PN26. See this is page number 26 on which this program is there. Okay. Now why this happens because uh, depending on the questions which come in the question paper, I keep on updating my printed notes almost every year. So that is why sometimes there could be a discrepancy in the page numbers which I tell in the video. But not to worry, if there is a discrepancy, if you don't find a question on the said page number, then all you need to do is look around. For example, if I say PN25, okay, 
what you do is just look around on the previous page and on the next page okay so somewhere over there you will find the required question so keep this thing in mind this will happen sometimes now let me also tell you something about your notebook now what you should do is when you are attending my online course you should compulsorily sit with a notebook uh, you should sit with a notebook and a pen whenever i tell you to copy something in your notebook see to it that you copy those programs in your notebook now many students they have a habit of taking screenshots now let me tell you why you shouldn't do this first of all if you take uh, if you keep taking screenshots of all the programs then by the time the course is over you will be in a mess everything will be messy okay so that's not the right way of doing things another reason why you should not take print out uh, sorry why you should not take screenshots and why you should write programs is see what happens is as i have told you that you will be having a theory exam in data structures and you might also have a theory exam in java and programs in data structures in java are very long very difficult okay so if you want to do well in your theory exam you should have a practice of writing those programs and that practice you will have only when you will write programs in your notebook so guys take this suggestion very seriously don't take screenshots of the program okay during the course of the video you will get sufficient time to copy those programs so so do that okay another thing is that while watching the video you should sit with a pen with four colors in it okay so ideally you can take a pen in which there are four uh, in the, in which there are four refills that is blue black green and red or you can take four different pens but basically the idea is i need four colors now why i'm telling you this because many a times what will happen is when i tell you to copy programs there will be certain statements in the program which will be in different color for example uh, let's say the entire program could be in black color and two statements could be in red color two in blue color so uh, the whole idea over here is to use colors intelligently okay now when i say use colors intelligently what exactly do i mean that i'll tell you later on when we actually start with the syllabus but for time being be convinced that if you use colors if you uh, copy programs with colors in them then remembering those programs will become very 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 simple okay so whenever i use a color in my programs you should also do that in your notebook okay so these were a few suggestions about how you should do things during the online course so now let's not waste time and let's get started with the course so let's start with chapter number 1 introduction to java give the heading chapter number 1 introduction to java and at that give a heading 1.1 history of java now the first half of this particular chapter is purely theory although it is theory you should not take it very lightly because from this theory you may get questions in your vivas in your oral exams and otherwise also you should know the introductory theory part of java so the theory is already there in your printed notes i will be explaining it now <clears throat> now before you understand the history of java first of all let's understand something in general in general what is a program and what is a programming language first of all the words program and software are equivalent they mean one and the same so now what is a program what is a software in very simple words every app on your cell phone is a program so instagram is a program facebook is a program microsoft word microsoft word is a program powerpoint is a program google chrome a web browser is a program now once you know what is a program let's understand what is a programming language a programming language is a language using which programs are written using which programs are coded using which programs are created for example in the earlier semester you developed programs using the c programming language and in this particular semester you will be developing programs using the java programming language so basically java is a programming language now having said having said all this let's understand the history of java pay good attention it's going to be a little difficult after some time 
So in the year 1990, there was an organization called Sun Microsystems of USA. And in 1990, they decided to develop software for consumer electronic devices. Now, what are consumer electronic devices? So something like refrigerator, uh, washing machine, oven, AC, all these are called consumer electronic devices. Now, these devices have small built-in programs in them and these built-in programs control the working of these devices. So in the year 1990, what Sun Microsystems did is they decided that they will develop software, they will develop programs and these programs will control these consumer devices. <clears throat> now in order to create such software, what they did is, what Sun Microsystems did is, they created a team called Green Project Team. This, this Green Project Team had many programmers, many scientists in it, but the team was headed by two programmers, two scientists called James Gosling and Patrick Norton. Okay. Now it was the work of the Green Project team to develop this software. Now as I told you, a software is nothing but a program and in order to write a program, you need a programming language. So initially what the Green Project team decided is, they decided that in order to develop this software, they will use the C++ programming language. I repeat C++. Now before moving further, let me tell you a little about languages. Every language has its advantages and its shortcomings and a particular language is used in a particular area. For example, the C programming language is the first choice for development of operating systems. So for example, the Windows operating system is coded in C programming language. Then let's come to C++. C++ is the first choice when you want to code video games. Yeah, that's right. If you want to develop video games, they are still developed in C++. After that, if you want to do any program on machine learning, artificial intelligence, then Python has become the first choice of late. So every programming language has its strength and its particular area where it is used most often. So now let's come back to this Green Project team and all this. So in the year 1990, the Green Project team decided to develop software for consumer electronic devices. And for that, they had decided to use the C++ programming language. Now, because of some reasons, they thought that C++ is not an ideal choice for development of this kind of software. So what they did is, they first decided to develop their own programming language. Please listen to this carefully. Their initial idea was to develop a software. But after that, they first thought that they will develop, they will create their own programming language and using that programming language, they will then develop this software. So what they did is by the year 1992, they developed their own object oriented programming language called Oak. So Oak is the name of a programming language which they developed by 1992. Now Oak had many useful features but the biggest, the most important feature of Oak was that it was completely almost 100% platform independent. Now let's understand the meaning of platform independent over here. For time being, please remember that platform over here means machine and machine over here means computer. So this Oak was 100% computer independent, machine independent. Now what exactly is the meaning of this? So in order to understand this, let's take a particular example. Let's say you have a HP laptop and your friend has a Dell laptop. You HP, your friend Dell. Now the internal machinery of these two laptops, the internal configuration of these two laptops will not be 100% same. I repeat, the internal machinery of these two laptops will not be exactly same. Now having, sa having said that, let's say on your HP laptop, you write a program to find factors of a number in C language. So you must have done this program in your semester one, uh, I mean in C programming language. So on your HP laptop, let's say you write a program to find factorial of a number 
and let's say this program works absolutely fine on your laptop it gives you the desired output now I have a question for you please listen to it carefully now let's say you give this program to your fr friend on a pen drive your friend copies this program on his Dell laptop and executes this program on his Dell laptop. Now my question to you is, will this program work exactly the same way on his laptop also? Will it give him the correct answer on his laptop also? What do you think? What is your answer? Yes or no? The answer is yes. This program will work exactly the same way on Dell laptop also. So what this means is, this means that this particular program is platform independent, machine independent, computer independent. That means the working of this program is independent of the machine on which it is being executed. So I hope you understood what is the meaning of platform independent. So O was completely platform independent. I always tell my students that world was a happy place before 1993 because all the problems which we have today they were born in 1993. Now why do I say that because in 1993 came up the world wide web also called the internet. Yes that's right. Now one thing which you should understand over here internet was not invented by this green project team okay internet was invented by some other set of people there was no relationship between this and this okay now before i move further again i want to tell you a few things in general what you should understand is that everything on the internet is a program every app you use on the cell phone facebook instagram everything all right is a program every web page which you see is a program for example this is the website of my institution this is the home page now i'll just show you something see i go over here all right <clears throat> and i go to this view source and when i click on this view source you will see this thing so this is basically a program written in JavaScript, HTML, CSS and when I execute this program, the output of this program is this web page. So remember one thing, this is actually the output and its program is this. And that's why I say that every web page is a program. Everything which you see on the internet is basically a program. Not only that, remember one more thing that in order to surf the internet, also you need a program and tell me what is that program called a web browser so google chrome is a web browser and that is basically a program okay now having understood this let's move further now as i told you internet was invented in 1993 but in 1993 this internet was very dry very boring it had only text in it for example it looked something like this See, this is also a web page and see how boring it is. So that is how internet looked in 1993. It had no charm in it and people were not very hooked up to internet. Now, whatever I'm going to tell you further, please listen to it very carefully. Now, what happened is when internet was invented in 1993, this James Gosling and Patrick Norton had one idea in their mind. Uh, they had a thought in their mind. What they felt is that this oak has two features because of which it will work very well for internet programming. Here onwards, whenever I say internet programming, I mean the programs of the internet. Or let me elaborate it. What I mean is that in 1993, James Goslick and Patrick Norton felt that oak can be used for writing those programs which work on the internet. Okay, that is what they felt in 1993. Uh, now, I said that uh, Oak had two features because of which it can be used for writing programs of the internet. So, some of you may have a doubt in your mind that which two features. So, I will tell you about those two features after some time. Okay. Anyway, so moving further. Now, with this thought in their minds, what uh, the Green Project team did is in 1993 they created something called web applets using oak now listen to this carefully 
Now, what is a web applet? A web applet is basically a web page. So, a web applet looked something like this. Now, what was so important about these web applets? So, what was important about it was web applets had sound, animation, uh, photographs in them. And because of which, people started liking these web applets a lot. The web applets were a runaway success. Why? Because they looked something like this. They did not look something like this. Okay, this is very dry, boring. The web applets looked like this, like this. Now, one thing which you should understand over here, the web applet was actually a program. It was a web page and it was written using the Oak programming language. So, give it a thought once again. Oak was the programming language and using the Oak programming language, web applets were created. They were developed in 1993. Now, encouraged by the success of web applets, in 1994, the Green Project team developed a web browser called Hot Java. So, Hot Java was the name of a web browser similar to Chrome which we use today. Again, this Hot Java was a runaway success. It became an overnight star. People started liking it a lot. Now, some of you may ask me, what is there in a web browser so that people started liking it a lot? So please understand one thing over here that we are talking about 1994. It is that time when you were probably not even born. Okay. Anyway, so this hot Java became a runaway success. Now encouraged by the success of web applets and hot Java, the green project team finally took a decision in 1995. In 1995, they decided Let's not use Oak for these small, small things, for these consumer electronic devices. No, let's not use Oak for these things. Let's use Oak for internet programming. That means let's use Oak for writing those programs which work on the internet. And with this thing in their minds, what they did is they renamed Oak as Java. Yes. So, the Java programming language which you are going to study was actually called Oak in the beginning. That Oak was renamed as Java. Finally, in 1996, the Sun Microsystems released their first official version of Java and that official version was called JDK 1.0. 1.0 is the version number and JDK stands for Java Development Kit. Okay. And since then, Java is known as the language of the internet. Now, let me elaborate on this thing, language of the internet. Listen to this carefully. When I say Java has become the language of the internet, what exactly it means? So, it means Java is a preferred choice for writing those programs which work on the internet. Okay, so that is what we mean by language of the internet. Programs which work on the internet are coded in Java. Alright, so this was the brief history of Java. This history is there in your printed notes. It's over here in this particular table which you can refer later on. Give the next heading 1.2 features of Java. In your theory exam or oral exam, you could be asked a question, what are features of Java? Or you could be asked a question, write a note on Java buzzwords. So this answer is there in your printed notes. You can simply write refer PN in your notebook, refer PN. Now, these are the prominent features of Java. Of all these prominent features, right now I'll explain you three features, object oriented, platform independent and bytecode. You may ask me why not the others. So the reason is, there are three reasons. One reason is that these features are not so very important. Second reason is that these features are pretty simple to understand. You can read your printed notes and understand these features. And one more reason why I'm not explaining these features right now is because in subsequent chapters, these features will get automatically covered. For example, later on, we'll do a, pro we'll do a chapter called multi-threading in which this feature will get covered. We'll do a chapter called exception handling in which this feature will get covered. So right now I'll stick to only three features. Now let's talk about object oriented. Now what is an object oriented language? 
any language which supports the concept of classes and objects is called object oriented c c language was not object oriented c++ and java are object oriented but we say that java is truly object oriented now which word was important in my last statement truly yes java is truly object oriented now what exactly that means see what happens is that when you write a program in c++ a c++ program can be written without classes and objects so anybody who has done c++ programming programming will know this but a java program cannot be written without a class moreover java considers every damn thing as an object so for java you and me are objects a printer a scanner a monitor are also objects for java so that is why we say java is truly object oriented because it considers everything as an object now what exactly is the meaning of object what is the meaning of class that we'll study in chapter number 4 moving ahead the next feature is platform independent or portable so we already know the meaning of this platform independent is also called portable and java is completely platform independent which means that if you write a program in java it can work on any machine irrespective of its internal machinery now let's come to the third important feature very important and that is byte code now what exactly this byte code is we'll have to understand this in great detail so please be very attentive now let's talk about the c programming language in c programming language you may write a statement like this or you may write a statement like this now this statement or this statement is called source code i repeat source code but the thing is that our computer cannot understand the source code I hope you must be knowing that a computer can understand only the language of ones and zeros which is called machine code. So this statement is something which we can understand. Its equivalent is this statement which the computer can understand. Similarly the equivalent of this statement is this which the computer can understand. So this is the source code, this is the machine code. Now we want the source code to be understandable to the computer so what we do is we install a compiler on our computer so for example if you want to do c programming on your computer then you will install a c compiler uh, i hope that in your earlier semester you must have installed turbo c++ uh, or you must have installed code blocks or dev c so this code blocks dev turbo they are basically c compilers Now what a C compiler will do is it will take the C program that means the source code and will convert it to machine code which the computer can understand so basically the compiler does the work of translation now this was about the C compiler C programming now let's talk about java again i will keep the diagram of C compiler in front of you for reference now what happens in java in java this work is done in two stages so in stage 1 we have java compiler this java compiler will take the java program that means the source code and will convert it to byte code now what exactly this byte code is so this byte code is an intermediate code it is intermediate between source code and machine code source code we can understand machine code computer can understand but byte code nobody can understand not even the machine but in spite of that this byte code is very important why it is important i'll tell you shortly anyway moving further so the java program source code is converted to byte code by java compiler which the machine cannot understand So now we have java interpreter which will convert the byte code to machine code which our computer can understand and it starts working it gives you some result Now let me tell you one thing over here every compiler every interpreter is basically a program so all these are programs which are doing some kind of translation By the way java interpreter is also called is also popularly called JVM the full form of jvm is java virtual machine 
although we use the word machine over here java interpreter is not a machine it is a program remember that okay so having understood all this if you are attentive those who are very attentive will have a question in your mind okay i give you 5 seconds come on think about the question so the question in your mind could be that why do we need two stages in java whatever work is done in c programming in one stage for that thing why does java need two stages so in one word the answer is the internet this two stage approach is very helpful for the internet so now the next question in your mind could be that how the two stage approach is helpful for the internet how it is useful for the internet i will answer that question but i will just remind you the client server model first i hope you remember we spoke about this so remember when you are on the internet your machine your computer is the client whenever you click on something your client computer is sending a request to the server and the server will process the request and will respond to the request for example this is my website and right now my computer is the client computer not the server okay now i am about to click on this downloads when i click on this downloads my client computer will send a request to the server the server will send a new web page which will be opened on my client so i'll click it now see when i clicked on it now you see a new web page so this new web page was the program which was sent by the server to the client so this is how things work on the internet this is basically the client server model what i will be teaching you now is the most difficult part of this entire chapter no teacher no textbook is going to explain you this concept properly so pay good attention to this particular concept now we need to understand over here that how the two stage approach is helpful for the internet in other words we also need to understand what is the importance of the bytecode so in order to understand that tell me one thing in java after compilation of source code you get bytecode or machine code the answer is that compilation gives bytecode now what happens is that in the client server model whenever the client clicks on something the server will send some data to the client now if the server is sending java program to client in case of java what will happen is that the server sends the bytecode to the client and not the source code to the client so what i am trying to tell you over here is the server itself will convert the java program from source code to bytecode and when the client clicks on something the server will send the bytecode to the client so i have a simple question for you if the server sends the bytecode to client is java compiler required on the client machine if you are slightly attentive earlier tell me about it no the answer is not required why do you need a java compiler when you already have the bytecode so on the client machine what do you need now you need the java interpreter the jvm this jvm will convert the bytecode to machine code and after that your computer will generate the output okay now what happens is having interpreter on the client machine is easier than having compiler now over here pay attention to this word easier it is not very easy to understand the meaning of the word easier let me elaborate this statement okay so pay good attention what i'm going to tell you now is very difficult and as i told you no one will teach you this concept properly so why do we say that having interpreter is easier than having compiler okay now what happens is these days all the web browsers are java enabled i repeat all the web browsers are java enabled now what is the meaning of java enabled java enabled means that the web browser has built in jvm it has built in java interpreter what i suggest is that you pause the video and write the meaning of java enabled java enabled means that a web browser has built in jvm 
Okay, let's move ahead. So what I was saying is that these days all the web browsers are Java enabled. So what happens is that the server, the server sends the bytecode to the client. Now on the client machine, the web browser will receive the bytecode. Listen carefully. On the client machine, the web browser will receive the bytecode. Inside the web browser, there is built-in JVM. This built-in JVM will convert the bytecode to machine code and will generate the output. Now, what happens is that it is easier to keep the Java interpreter JVM inside the web browser instead of keeping the Java compiler inside the web browser. Okay. Now, why is that the case? So, what you need to understand over here is that you don't need to install any component of Java over here. Okay, understand this properly. You never needed Java compiler because the server has already sent you the bytecode. And you don't even need to install Java interpreter. Why? Because the web browser is Java enabled and it has built in JVM. This built-in this built-in JVM took the bytecode from the class server and the it converted bytecode to machine code and it generated the output. Now what happens is having the interpreter inside the web browser is much easier than having the Java compiler. Now what exactly this word easier means? So what happens is if you look over here, see this is my computer on which I have installed Google Chrome, the web browser and its size is 450 MB okay so see Google Chrome Google Chrome is approximately 450 MB all right Java compiler is approximately Java compiler is approximately 500 MB okay and the JVM that is the Java interpreter is approximately 50 MB. Now listen to this very carefully. Some students ask me a question. What they tell me is, sir, why do we need the two stage approach in Java? Why not do this way? Now why not do what? Listen carefully. So these students tell me, sir, let's let the server send the source code to the client. Let the client web browser have a Java compiler and let the Java compiler convert the source code to machine code thereby generating the output. Okay, if you didn't understand, just rewind the video by 10 seconds and listen to this once again. Now what is the problem with this approach? The problem with this approach is that in this approach we'll have to keep the compiler inside the web browser. Now, if you look at the sizes of these softwares, you will realize it is not a very wise decision to keep a 500 MB compiler inside a 450 MB web browser. Because by doing that, the size of the web browser will become double, more than double. So a better option is that you keep a small JVM inside the web browser, which will increase the size of the web browser by hardly 10%. And that is what we mean when we say that having interpreter on client is easier than having compiler. Okay, that is what the word easier means. Now, there is one more advantage of the two-stage approach. There is one more advantage of the bytecode. Now, what exactly is that? Again, it is difficult. It is interesting. No one will teach you this. Pay attention. Now, let's say you write a program to find factors of a number and let's say you first write the program in C language now if you write the program in C language that means the C language is a source code you will give this program to C compiler C compiler will convert the source code to machine code and will generate the output let's say that the time taken by C compiler to convert source code to machine code is 100 millisecond so this means that it took 100 milliseconds for the C program to execute. Okay. Now let's say you write the same program, the factorial program in Java. And now you want to execute this Java program. 
So what will happen is you will first give this Java program to a Java compiler and let's say that Java compiler takes 70 milliseconds to convert you tell me what source code to byte code okay the Java program is the source code the Java compiler will convert it to byte code in 70 milliseconds let's say now after that you will need JVM let's say that JVM takes 50 milliseconds to convert byte code to machine code and then the program executes okay so now what is the total time taken by java program to execute it is 120 milliseconds so now guys tell me one simple thing which will work faster over here c or java the answer is java on the internet yes think about it on the internet java will work faster can you tell me how the answer is very simple See what happens is that in Java the server will send the bytecode to the client and if the server sends the bytecode to the client then on the client machine this compiling is not at all required so it will become 0 milliseconds. So that means this Java program on the client will execute in 50 milliseconds which is half of 100 so the Java program becomes much 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 faster over here ok. So, the second importance, the second reason why we have this two-stage approach is because this two-stage approach becomes faster on the internet. Okay. Now many a times in your exam you may get a question that why is Java known as the language of the internet. First let me explain you these three words language of the internet. Language of the internet means that Java is the most preferred choice for writing those programs which work on the internet. So why is Java known as the language of the internet? Do you remember that I had told you that in Java there are two features because of which James Gosling thought that it will become a very good language for the internet. Do you remember this? So those two features are bytecode and platform independence. I repeat bytecode and platform independence. So Java is known as the language of the internet because of its bytecode and because of its platform independence. And how the bytecode helps the internet that is what I have explained in these points which you see in blue color over here. Okay. Now very quickly, very quickly I will also explain you that how the platform independence helps the internet. I hope you remember that Java was originally called Oak and Oak was designed to be used in software for consumer electronic devices. Because Oak was to be used in consumer electronic devices, right from the beginning it was platform independent or portable. Now uh, let's understand these two points in detail over here. So let's go back uh, in the history, in the history of Java and let's understand this in detail. Uh, in order to understand this, let's take example of one LG washing machine and a Samsung washing machine. Again a question. Now what do you think the internal machinery, the internal architecture of these two washing machines will be exactly same or slightly different? So the answer is slightly different. Now let's say I write a program in some programming language, in some programming language and this program controls the LG washing machine. Now if the program is not platform independent, I repeat not platform independent, then will the same program, will the same program work on the Samsung washing machine? Will it work on the Samsung washing machine? Yes or no? So the answer is no. As a programmer what I will have to do is, I will have to change that program slightly so that it starts working on the Samsung washing machine. And this happens because this program is not platform independent. So now in this world there are uh, there could be thousands of different types of washing machines. In fact if you take even one particular company like LG then in LG itself there are uh, hundreds of different types of models of washing machines. So if the program is not platform independent then as a programmer I will have to write different different programs for different different washing machines 
and that is something very strenuous okay very cumbersome so what i would want is i would want my program to be platform independent that means if i write a program which works on lg washing machine then the same program must work on samsung washing machine also and this is possible only when the program only when the programming language is platform independent now this was something which the developers of oak knew right from the beginning remember their original aim was to develop software for consumer electronic devices and they did not and they never wanted to write different different programs for different different washing machines so they developed oak as a language which was 100% platform independent so that they write only one program and it will work on all the machines okay i hope you understood that now this feature of platform independence okay the way it is required on consumer electronic devices it is similarly required on the internet also it is a very uh, i will say it is a blessing for the internet now why did i say that because please understand one thing that internet connects various devices and these different devices have different architecture different machinery but although these devices have different architecture the web page should appear the same way on all the machines on all the computers now in order to explain you that let me give you a simple example but before i give you a simple example uh, uh, i'll just give you an advice over here see guys you are comp it engineers and you will probably uh, end up working in a software industry so guys here onwards you should think like programmers every small thing you see in your real life you should think like a programmer now what do i mean when i say this so let's understand with the help of an example so guys this is my facebook profile page okay and you know this is called the cover photo okay now i have opened this page on my macbook okay and the cover photo looks over here now let's say you open this page on your hp uh, by the way i hope you are listening to what i am saying uh, you may look at my wife later on okay you can do that later on okay pay attention to what i am saying right now okay all right so what i was saying is let's say you open this web page on your hp laptop now if you open this page on your hp laptop will you see the cover photo over here or somewhere else the answer is you will see it right here even on the dell computer you will see it at the same place so a simple point i am trying to make over here is that this web page is platform independent no matter on which machine you open this page no matter on which computer you open this page you will see things at the same place you will see the cover photo here you will see the profile photo here okay now that is what i was saying that internet connects various devices these devices have different architectures but in spite of that the appearance of the web pages the working of the web pages should remain exactly same and that is possible only when the language in which that web page is written is platform independent okay so because java is platform independent when you write a java program and when that program works on the internet the working will be same for all the computers all the machines okay so i so i hope you have understood all this the points which you see in blue color are related to bytecode the points which you see in red color are related to platform independence and because of bytecode and platform independence java is known as the language of the internet so this answer is there in your printed notes you can just write refer pn in your notebook so in your printed notes you will find this question over here this is the question all right so that was this question give the next heading 1.3 types of programs this topic is quite simple now whatever programs we will do in java these programs are broadly divided into two categories the first category is application programs and the second category 
is called applets. So broadly speaking, whenever you do any Java program, it is either an application or an applet. Now let's talk about applet first. Now these applets are small, tiny programs which are meant to be transmitted over the internet. So this means that the applets will be transmitted by the server to the client on the internet. Keep one thing in mind that the applets are compiled on server and they are interpreted on the client using web browser. Now you already know the last two points but still once again I'll tell you. See what will happen is on the server the on the server the source code of the applet will be converted to bytecode that means the compilation will be done on the server and the server will send a bytecode of the applet to the client. On the client machine there will be a web browser this web browser is Java enabled and this web browser will have the built-in JVM which will convert the bytecode to machine code and then the applet will execute. So that's how an applet works. Now let's come to application programs also called applications. Now an application program is basically a standalone program. Now although it is simple pay attention to this because you don't know what I'm going to say. See now what is an application program or what is a standalone program? A standalone program is that program which does not need internet for its working. So let's take example of Facebook. Do you think Facebook is a standalone program? The answer is no because Facebook cannot work without the internet. Now let's take example of Microsoft Word. Tell me one thing. Can you work on Microsoft Word if there is no internet on your computer? Think about it. Of course you can. Okay, you don't need internet for the basic working of Microsoft Word. So I will say that Microsoft Word is a standalone program or I will call it an application program. So when you are using Java, you can create two types of programs. One is application programs which do not need internet for their working and you can create applets which need internet for their working. Now there is this diagram which depicts how these two types of programs work. Now what I suggest is that you pause this video, okay, go through this diagram and after that I will explain this diagram so that way you will find it much simpler. So do that. Okay, I hope you went through this diagram. So now what this diagram says is, let's say there is an applet and let's say this is the Java source code of the applet. Now what will happen is the server will take the applet, okay, the server will take, uh, what will happen is that on the server there will be a Java compiler. This Java compiler will take the applet and will convert the source code of the applet to bytecode. So the server has done the compilation and now the bytecode is ready. Now the bytecode of the applet is sent to client. On the client, there is a Java enabled web browser. That means in the web browser, there is JVM. This JVM will convert the bytecode to machine code and the output is generated. Okay. All right. Now let's say you have Java source code of the application application. Okay. So now what will happen is the application works without the internet. In other words, the application will work on a standalone computer, not a server, not any client. So now what you need is that if you have an application, then you will need a Java compiler also. The Java compiler will convert the source code of the application to bytecode. And then that bytecode, the bytecode of the application will be given to Java interpreter, which will again convert the bytecode to machine code and you get the output. So this is how things work in case of application. Okay. All this is there in your printed notes over here. So again, you don't need to write anything. Just write refer PN, refer printed notes.